Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm David Ross, and this is the, the Artist Roundtable uh, webinar uh, from the School of Visual Arts in New York from the Curatorial Practice Program uh, run by Stephen Madoff. Um, I uh, run a different program here at, at, at SVA, the, uh, the MFA in Art Practice, uh, but it's a great pleasure uh, to be uh, partaking in, in Stephen Madoff's program because I get to meet every year a group of young uh, curators who are uh, studying before they enter into the fray of curatorial work one way or the other. Today, uh, we have uh, with us, uh, to my group, with, with, for my great pleasure, a, a dear old friend, uh, Don Dedeau. Uh, Don is an artist who, um, who uh, works out of New Orleans. Uh, and um, and you know is um, she's a southern artist, and uh, you know it, it's a, this is a really important time I think to hear from uh, from a, from an artist from the American South because uh, you know we 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 understand that you know we're all Americans here in the United States, but you know things are different in different parts of this country, and uh, and and it, that has an effect on uh, on the work that many artists produce. Uh, and so uh, today we're really happy to have Dawn talk a bit about her practice and how it's evolved and projects that she's involved with. Before I turn it over to Dawn, I just want to ask her one thing because she's had she's had a re remarkably varied career. You know, she helped found the Contemporary Arts Center here in New Orleans, and uh, and you know she's been very active in the in the artist community in that in that region as well as in that city. Um, she just had a major retrospective at the New Orleans Museum of Art, which uh, I wish I'd been able to see. Um, but uh, but uh, I heard a lot about it from a lot of our mutual friends. But the one question I just want to leave you with, Don, is that in 1976, you won a, the Demolition Derby, a Demolition Derby for, uh, held at the New Eng at the New Orleans Superdome. Now that's that's generally not in most artists' CV, so that's something I've never asked you about before, Don. Okay. <laughs> so welcome, Don. <laughs> Thank you, David, for the great introduction and the surprise question. Um, I'll first say it was 1975. Uh huh. So I'm sure you got 76 from some of the bio stuff, but yeah, exactly. It's correct. To 75, and it was the year the Superdome was first built in New Orleans. And this, oddly enough, was the first venue before the football season started. So um, I was working for a newspaper, Figaro, and the editor publisher, James Glassman, was trying to get some mail on the staff to enter the demolition derby to see if it was rigged or just to go undercover. He kept saying, Don would even do it, wouldn't you? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's no big deal. So the next day, no man agreed to do it. And he held my feet to the fire. He said, you said you'd do it, and I'm holding you to it. <laughs> so uh, I can't, I take up the whole webinar time right now, if I gave you the full story. But I was the only female contestant in a field of 35 drivers. And I... Uh, Fortunately, ran into a man, Jumping Joe, who lost his leg in such a venue, and he gave me tips. I applied his tips my first time ever in a demo derby. And the way I won ultimately is he said, at the very end, the bottom line, you want to back your opponents into critical mass. First time I had heard that term. So in the middle of the Superdome, there's a pyramid of cars, all men. And I took the last two drivers out. I just backed. He said, don't back them into air, back them into something. So I backed him into the triangle of the pyramid of cars. And it was a legitimate win. And how this is listed on my art practice uh, resume is that one event taught me that anything was possible, that magic happens, that you just throw yourself into the ring, so to speak. So 
Thanks for bringing it. It, it, sound, it seemed to me that you were just trying to find a, a better way of of making sculpture than you know using normal tools in a, in a normal facility. But anyway, why don't you take over the screen? And we I, looking forward to your presentation. And um, of course, uh, if any of you in the webinar audience have any questions, you can send them to the Q and A. If we have time, Don will respond to them. And after an hour, of course, then we go into our private. Uh, Zoom space with the graduate students in the curatorial practice program. So uh, Dawn, take it away. Thank you. All right. So this is a general uh, presentation uh, and I called it going down with the ship, which would mean sinking with the Louisiana landscape, going underwater, sinking with the ship or going up with another ship. And that has been my mothership uh, outer space uh, series. If all things fall to hell here, last resort, I'm preparing uh, to head up. And this is my, uh, my own personal spaceship. And I'm having a martini awaiting the end. <laughs> Ready for the apocalypse. This was a poster image I used early on and I can't seem to shake it. Uh, some of the things I'd like to uh, bring up, and they, it might be in order and it might be uh, not, but the idea of watching time slip sliding away. Part of uh, what you asked, David, or your interest was Dawn as Southern artists. It's less so much for me the Southern politic, but I will get into that. But it's more so this, I, men, I live... Uh, with the view of the fastest eroding landmass in the world. And we have many, many ecological challenges here, and that has informed my work, and I will share this place, and that leads to next sense of place. Many times describing Southern art, you say uh, it's it, ha it deals with sense of place. Well, I would say it's somewhat of a senseless place, um, and uh, anyway, it is a sportsman's paradise, or was, that is changing in definition. And then I will add two other Liebestroms. I've done some things on Hitler's quest for new land, Liebestrom. We've got a lot of uh, borders we'll get to. So what is Southern? I will take that on, but I'll let you know that even in my own town, uh, the Ogden Museum of Southern Art doesn't even consider me, doesn't collect my work much because they really don't think I embody what a Southern artist is. So that is another caveat. Okay, then you're going to hear me speak a lot about water. There's either too much, lately too little, which I'll explain. And then it's too late what is coming in because it's so significantly polluted. So we'll get to that. Civil wars, this comes from a conversation we had Sunday, David, and there are shifting maps. We are in a time uh, of, of, of great polarization, but it's not as simple as it once was uh, with the Mason-Dixon line. We now have a shifting map. We have a lot of blue dots in red states. And just for the record, New Orleans is a blue dot in a very red state. Uh, moving on, beginnings of the ends, Anthropocenes. I don't know that I'll get to this actually, but uh, I say let's start with sugar. I'll explain. Well, I'll tell. I'll tell you now, and then we'll roll on. Uh, I'm very interested in Anthropocene uh, writings, and I meditate on that a lot. A philosopher friend of mine says, "No, it should be Ecocene." Anyway, I did hear a lecture by Donna Haraway. She was a biologist, kind of became more and more into philosophy, eco-philosophy. And she said, some would say the Anthropocene began with the Industrial Revolution, but I think it is uh, the corporatization, the industrialization of agriculture, which takes people from one side of the Atlantic by force, brings them to the Americas, and then grows, let's say, sugar, and then sends all that sugar back to Europe. So she thought that this was one of the greatest destabilizing uh, impacts. And 
Southern, if you want to go Southern, being a Louisiana girl, we raise a lot of sugar. So, of course, this interests me. And where I am now, I'm uh, kind of uh, like a rolling stone, and I'll explain that later. Without further ado, watching time, this is the projected amount of land mass that will soon be gone here in Louisiana. So this uh, is a landscape panel with the divide clearly indicated. These are the kind of things we see. In addition to rising sea level and sinking landmass, we also have hurricanes. And uh, we also had a big asteroid hit the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a lot happening here. Um, I'll say that this is from one of my uh, trying to project in the future photo works, and I'm holding a crystal ball. I've got a dead planet out there. But, of course, none of us can predict the end of time. But there are certainly uh, some people who have earmarked 2045 as an end of life, quality of life as we know it now on Earth, to be discussed later. All right. In just in measure of time, to put this in your headspace, we are losing land, a football field every 38 minutes, okay? Now, this is a picture that I took of where my family's weekend home was on past Christian, Mississippi. And there, there are their linens. That's how ferocious. The house was gone, but... That, that has had a lot to do with my psyche. All right. Somebody, I'm just checking the phone. Somebody, it's, David, if you have a message, you can just tell me. So I'm not worried it's yeah, coming from you. No problem, no problem. All right. This is kind of an eye of a storm. Of course, we've had many here, but there was one big, big, episode that happened 65 million years ago when an asteroid hit the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it's really straight from New Orleans right before you get to uh, the, the Caribbean, uh, the Gulf of Mexico coast of South America. So it killed, uh, you know, most uh, living forms. And uh, I've done a lot with the fact that playing with the asteroid, playing with hurricane shapes, which, by the way, mimics the galaxy, the formation of the galaxy. So there's a lot of uh, rhythm and rhyme and, and similarity. This is a piece. It's a glass floor. I'll keep moving. Uh, tons of shattered glass that I throw out to create these swirls of hurricanes riding over the gulf. In this case, I wanted it to also look like a galaxy, not just the, the gulf, because in my time now, I'm not so gulf specific. I'm thinking of the planet more in a global way. So this piece started in 2007, and this was a 2020 rendition, which became more cosmic. This piece was at Transart Foundation for Art and Anthropology in Houston. And if I, I'll show the student, uh, your students more of that later. This was how it first started in 2007. It was a bit more of a, uh, a grid and formal. And this was a variation of the piece I just did for the uh, New Orleans retrospective show called Space Between Worlds. Also dealing with this area, water markers. Uh, these are lucite, thick two inch, sometimes three inch lucite slabs that are of varied height. And I fill them uh, on the backside. I, uh, I, I do watery imagery. And each of these heights relates to a flood level reached in New Orleans and the surrounding neighborhoods. This is one, uh, well, I'll tell you that. So this is the watermarkers uh, that I have done over a 
good long period of time and they were all assembled for the retrospective and it's called Water High Rise. And that is kind of a picture of what happened during Hurricane Katrina in different neighborhoods. So you get the impact. Uh, we got in some places uh, 20 feet of water. I don't have one that high because I couldn't afford the acrylic. <laughs> So this is a view in the retrospective of the water. And then on the left, after we had the big uh, storm and floods, um, people couldn't come into the city or weren't supposed to, but some people came in uh, who were homeless and on the first cold day and set a fire in my studio and it went out of control with high winds. So those timbers I called burnt chimes, but it's, it's also dealing with the elements, dealing with the transitory nature, transient life. And I'm not sorrowful now about the barn studio burning because I actually love this piece. Okay. So that's the fire. This was my studio right after Katrina going up. And this is the beautiful finish that real hot fires will leave you with. In the retrospective, there's a big piece through the, you see a doorway on the left. Through that, there's a 70 foot wall. And coincidentally, uh, it's a moment in this big video piece where the whole wall is on fire. In uh, Katrina also, it knocked out houses, it disfigured uh, the lower ninth ward, a lot of the houses were washed away. And all that remained were some of the stoops. And uh, I did this series called Steps Home. They illuminate from within, so at night they could form somewhat of a lighthouse. So I first showed them very site-specific in New Orleans and then brought them to Marfa, Texas, where they were out in the out in this plateau near uh, Indian ruins. And I love that it went from a specific loss in New Orleans to something that was more timeless and time rolls on. You'll see that little dark line going, that's the train track that goes from New Orleans all the way out to LA. So uh, I was happy that train passengers could see it. Of course, Ballroom Marfa brought their, uh, uh, supporters, their um, art enthusiasts up to my plateau areas to see the works. So this is twilight where it's getting a bit of a of a light. Here is uh, day, night. Then it, uh, during Prospect One, they went in front of the New Orleans Museum of Art. This was a study I had done to put them all throughout the park. Um, always thinking big, thinking big, anyway. And this was uh, a study for Martha of the, the uh, steps out on the Mesa. Another uh, Katrina experience, of course, you know, the, the houses flooded. So many were, if they didn't get washed away, they were scheduled for teardown because they were so sculpturally compromised. David, I think you were there for this, right? For this piece, did you come to the wetland? Yeah, land? I did see that. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. So this was a house that was scheduled for demolition, and I did installations in different rooms. This was overturing Faulkner as I lay dying. I dug through the house and into the earth below, and had uh, some reading of Faulkner uh, in the room. And this was a room. Uh, with a chair, a lot of people of modest means, I, I'm always so moved that they cover their furniture. So in these little houses, such furniture was uh, a norm. And so here, lots of dirt in the house and I planted 400 cypress trees. In the front room, this was a, a different interpretation of a piece I did with the musician composer, Terence Blanchard, called called um, oh, Dirge for Journey. He, his gorgeous album 
compositions uh, inspired by Katrina. There's a piece, Dirge, and I was working on this piece, and when I heard it, I just broke into tears. So there are musical instruments. You can see to the left, there's a horn with instruments. They're scattered throughout the variations of this piece. And uh, you'll see it later in the retrospective. Um, what I did in the retrospective, I was only able to take the small horn piece, but Terence Blanchard's soundtrack became such a poignant score to the experience of the retrospective. This was a piece from the mid nineties. And it was when I was first turning more to environmental issues. And I was coming, and this is a, a piece that is based on Tennessee Williams play, Suddenly Last Summer. Now, David, there again, that I do grab on to literature. This is probably the most overt southern piece because uh, i don't know if those listening know the play but the protagonist prota um, sebastian from a wealthy family here in new orleans sets out to uh travel the world and hopes to see the face of god and then write his one great poem but of course uh that all goes awry now, I don't have any dialogue in this piece. I created it. It's a half an hour piece in five suites, uh, only accompanied by a cello and hundreds of sound effects of nature. So, uh, the well, I'll say when I first did the piece for the Olympics in 96 in Atlanta, it was a full surround piece with videos hitting the walls, the, the bed, and the floor. But since, uh, for the retrospective, to keep the flow going, we turned it into a three-wall piece that you could just walk past. But video does hit the bed of the piece, and this is seaweed. At some point, um, the building, I mean, the room sinks to the bottom of the sea. Why? Because I forgot to mention that where does Sebastian see God? Well, he finally sees God on an Encantada's beach. He's been out there all day watching the bloodbath, as he says, uh, where all the baby sea turtles are hatching and rushing to get from the sand into the water to survive. And the iguanas come, the seabirds come, mostly the seabirds he writes about. But Sebastian stands on the bloody beach and says, I at last see the face of God. Now, I took big issue with this because I don't want to find God in consumption. Don't like that. So I said, if you're going to find God in consumption, you don't have to leave your room because we're born to die. We're consumed. You know, we get to a certain point of cell growth and then it diminishes. So I had a young sister who died. Uh, and it really, uh, when I was a young girl, she died at six, um, I was nine, and it impacted me. All of us have suffered losses, it shapes our worldview. But this is a little bad. She had a liver cancer and she was young and her cell growth was going rapid. So she just kind of died before our eyes. And this looks like a bed right now, but it turns also into a hosp hospital bed. So this is a confession. I don't tell people that there's any autobiography usually related to this piece, but it is for me, it was maybe my first autobiographical um, infusion. The turtles laying their eggs in the sand. I end the piece, by the way, Sebastian finds God on a bloody beach. I said, no, I find God in art. So this cello that's been playing the whole time, I finally bring the cello live, treating it like a moving x-ray. And those strings line up with the strings of the, the bed, the rails of the bed. And uh, I close it out with, you know, I don't know if God has a face, but God moves us to create art or we invent art. <laughs> Who knows? That's for all of you individually to determine. But that was my God. All right, space clowns. Um, we have uh, 
moving forward. We had the other things happen after Katrina. We had oil spills, earthquakes, fires, uh, air quality reduction. And it just hit me. I said, even if we stay on Earth, we might need protective suits to to stay here. Things are getting so crazy. So I think it may have been 2012. I, I did a Rauschenberg residency out in Captiva, Florida. And they gave, because I, the only time I won the lottery for being old, because I was the oldest artist, they gave me Rauschenberg's big studio. <laughs> That's a, so... I, it was sure. fabulous. I used his equipment and backdrop. It, it, it was just great. And I invited first responders from around South Florida to come in and let me photograph them. And that became, that was the beginning of the Space Clown series. First, it was photography, first responders. Um, like, I love this as a pure photo. But I did use these photo sessions to create um some fanciful um suits i'll show you upcoming but these were some of the first responders i think i had packed away the photos for a long while but i'm i'm starting to like just the photos again and eva diaz uh did an article on the photos for um aperture and she's got a book coming out and she's going to She's featuring those. Now here's where I turned it into silly, right? Space clowns, uh, it's happy and it's sad. And uh, here's one of them, Daisy. The first ones I did that got this decorative, I, I turned to, to Space Odyssey and to how Daisy, Daisy, you know. Uh, so, Very good. Well, let me let me get the first, first space, space clown there. But here it was shown with a, a bomb balloon. Like we don't know, for instance, if the greatest challenge of our survival is gonna be something big or if it's gonna be macro, like a, you know something small. So here I'm playing with, well, what if it, it just comes in a small box and we're toast? Here's another uh, kind of decorative space clown called Red Velvet, very sensual. Um, and uh, um, I have him in one of my rooms. He, he makes me smile. Could be a she. Some people think it's a woman. This is a space clown. Uh, it's kind of wavy gravy or coming unplugged. And uh, floating in front of this space clown is the um, Ebola. So anyway, again, I'm dealing with the macro and the micro, but one way or the other, we need the suits. And um, okay, there's a lot of detail in these, um, so you can't see it when I just show you full body. So this will show you a little bit of all of the uh, craziness. And uh, this one is based really more on the uh, the first Apollo, but I call him Space Clown Matador, right? Little lace on him. Okay, we're getting and. Uh, 12 blue boy i did a series after blue boy this is a space shroud kind of a moment where he starts to explode there we go you know i reduced for the first time ever i reduced this the pixels of my presentation uh being assured it wouldn't impact it but i can see things are a little fuzzy so i apologize so I also take myself on, right? I, I became a space clown during COVID. I have um, lots of fun uh, videos of me walking around in my compound by myself in my space and uh, flower arrangements. Now, in the beginning of this uh, I little talk, I mentioned that we were the fastest eroding landmass. And why is that so? Well, the oil companies didn't help because they dug canals to get out to oil platforms in the Gulf through the marsh and then didn't fill them. And that allowed a rush in of salt water, which kills plants. So this is an oak tree graveyard. There are 
I would say maybe 400 dead oak trees that died within a few years. Again, going to a Southern theme, a Southern logo, gosh, the oak tree, the live oak. So here, this was heartbreaking when I went out to this area and this kind of scene impacted my work and also led me into landscape directions. I had done landscapes in the early 90s when I, uh, around the time with Face of God. I, this is a, a, from a series, Postcards to Teddy Roosevelt While Thinking of Eve's Klein, where I'm, Teddy, you didn't protect this zone. And then I, I'm just diving into it for, because I like Eve's Klein. I love that picture of him jumping out the window. So uh, I won't justify it any further, but, um, these were, this was uh, also in the early 90s. I was covering forest fires. This is out in Santa Fe. This is the lead, the, the man in the middle in yellow was the lead fire captain for the whole effort. Um, out in landscapes, this is an early landscape of mine on the interstate. Um, I stopped to film some clouds and, and there was a dead deer and I filmed it from day into dark. Then this is, it was a video piece and some stills. This is very grainy, but this is uh, the great array, the satellites also uh, out in, I think, New Mexico with cattle grazing in front. And then I went to the big power lines that run through the West and sheep grazing. So juxtaposing, uh, animal life, nature with technology and, okay. Now this is the face of God. This, I put this in because of animals. These are the baby turtles, a close up of them hatching. And when they start to hatch, they hatch on this bed. You don't have any image on the wall yet. You just, it's a birthing. All these turtles are birthing on the bed and crawling all over the bed. And then they end up on the walls. So. This again was done when I was doing those landscapes with the cows and the deer. And and, and then who is the greatest culprit? Uh, we endanger turtles more than anyone, uh, not the birds or the iguanas. Uh, humankind kills more turtles than anyone. So this was uh, work that in. I had mentioned that this uh, face of God turned into a hospital scene. So in the last suite, it uh, becomes a hospital room. It's funny, it lets nature in, but when we're really trying to save our life at the end, most people deny nature. They put us in uh, hermetic rooms and hospitals to keep out bacteria and con other contagions. I'm, I'm sorry this is here, it should have been earlier. Okay, landscapes. This is a landscape taken from that photograph of the hundred oak trees dead, a lot of the silhouettes of those trees are woven into this landscape. This one is about 28 feet. Um, and of course, again, the, the moss, the Southern moss, I went ahead and put, put that in. Let's drip it with moss, but it's dead. And we did it. We did it. Other landscapes, here's an, one of the dead oaks, but you know, I'm, I'll tell you later about spaceships. I'm into the spaceship mothership series and in two dimensional work and even outdoors sometime, I used the first single ring used to build the Zeppelin. Why the Zeppelin? Because it's the airship that can hold the most people, not, it was the largest airship to date. Of course, the little cabin can't hold them. But I've used the Zeppelin form to make my own spaceships. And when it's landing in different areas, I just drop the ring. You'll also notice in this landscape, many, many ladders. Um, they're escape ladders to get out of the rising water or contaminants, get into the trees, get into rings. This is a dying landscape uh, that I did on a on a, a stainless steel, and it's uh, 
again, mixing in technology with the landscapes, more moss. Ladders with landscapes, a lot of them I make for outdoors. Okay, this is dealing with the landscape and dealing with the rising water. This was supposed to be a live data wall that was gonna be on the front of the New Orleans Museum of Art using pings to measure how fast the water is coming in in different areas. In the end, one, it proved um, to be impossible because the owner of a company that was going to be really the big lead on this unexpectedly died and a few other things happened. But I wanted to show you these. This was a big public art ambition because you can talk about rising water and land sink, but what if you could really see how it was getting eaten away live and put these out in big public spaces? So, um, okay. Another project, into the road, there is this uh, road in southern Louisiana that is soon going underwater. This little road connected to this island, Pointe aux Chen, which all the people on Pointe aux Chen are now being relocated elsewhere. So this was, again, let's put a public face, let's put a face on what's happening. So there's the little roadway going through that sliver of land. And uh, Prospect was backing it. We had hundreds of people that were being bused there for that day. And then we had uh, another little incident because um, there are rival Indian tribes and the Biloxi Chittimacha threatened to kill everyone on the road if the Homa Indians showed up on the road. So the day before this was happened, it had, it, the, the, the head of prospect at the time uh, killed the deal. She didn't want uh, to take a chance. Here's the little road. And I went anyway, it's not a good picture of me, but I went anyway. Um, there were supposed to be motorcycle gangs that were gonna ride on the road at this particular time to kill the other tribe, but that didn't happen and I went there. The idea was to have this road packed with people I had film crews, people in planes, people in boats. We were going to capture this, let it go viral, that people really live here. It's not like you go fishing out in the Gulf sometime. People live here. So that was the idea. Now, the, you know, we had Katrina, and that was bad enough. And But I was not prepared. We're in recovery. People are rebuilding. And then we had that damn BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And you see the ruining, the killing the wildlife and the oyster beds, and I love oysters, and using Corexit uh, to try to disperse the oil. It doesn't get rid of the oil, it just hides it from you. So that adds extra chemical to the water. In addition to those chemicals with the oil spill, this area is the bottom of the Mississippi River. So we get all the chemical, all the estra, all the um, nitrates from the farmers up river. We get all the estrogen that have goes <laughs> from everybody's birth control pills. It's a mess. So when I said in the beginning, water too much, then too little, I have to explain. But then when you do get it, it's polluted. Uh, when I spoke to David Sunday, you know, part of what I was doing Sunday is I'm bottling water because the salt, I'm going to tell you that in a minute. Let me finish the mutants. Okay. So these are these orbs that I formed that can float and they had tests. We didn't, it couldn't go big scale, but it had a tester where it could read chemical content in the water and it would change colors is the idea. So this is not a real, this is just a little mock-up. We were going to put them out in the swamps. This is up the Mississippi River. This is a river bridge. Lots of mutants floating. Of course, I always think too big. But David, actually, I want to thank you. When I was trying to raise money for this project, I yes. think you sent in a donation. 
I believe I did. You did. So it didn't get all the way the river, but it helped with those prototypes. So thank you. <laughs> David is the best. All right. Oil spill, chains, industry. Um, I have a lot of broken chains because I thought it was break in command, right? A dropout in command. Who was the BP head at the time? Tony? Tony, what was Tony's name? Tony, he was at the country club in England, the, the chair, CEO of BP. And um, this is the bottom, uh, the bottom right is a, a kind of a colonial uh, little sculpture I did for him. Anyway, here's oyster cubes to the bottom left and throughout this show I did. So I, since all the oil, the since the oil was killing all the oyster beds, I said, well, let me preserve some of the shells. And I had many, many oyster dinner parties. And um, there you go. Now, also related to chemical content in water. David, this is very Southern, okay? This is all very Southern uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. This... <laughs> This is a, a few, uh, I did a series, 18 member family, three generations. So this is a few of them and they're large uh, vessels of water with images embedded. And when I fill them up with water, um, they get a bit eerie. And it's, what's, what are we leaving behind? What are we leaving behind for, for children and uh, future generations? what's in the water. So this is uh, a few of these pieces. And these are three in my house right now, still have. So one drop is a video work I did. Um, if, if you can imagine a little tiny glass of water where the diameter of the, is no more than two inches and I filled it with water and I filmed the water in the, uh, I filled the clouds and the trees in the water and the wind activated, activated it and it looked like an angry planet. And um, the reason I did the little drop of water in this piece called One Drop is I wanted to make a point that whatever is in the water here say the corrects it, the oil, all the chemicals, you should be concerned about it too because this little drop of water will go out of the Gulf of Mexico, will go up the Gulf Stream, up the East Coast, cross the Atlantic into Greenland, and water is one body. So this, I did the film, and when I saw that the wind turned it into this kind of planet-looking thing, I, I've always projected it on a wall as a as a um, a piece and it's very impactful it's so simple and pure and unedited and it's just this you know 15 minutes of time that transports you um considering also that here in my southern house i live down the river from the largest array of chemical refineries and sometimes when the wind's not right, uh, you can smell it. And people close to those refineries and plants actually have high rates of cancer. So thinking that that was just a precursor to what could happen globally, I said, well, I need to introduce breathing rooms so you can have places in parks if you want to be outside with air that pumps through them. Okay. So these, this was like, <laughs> This was a guy who came into the show and I thought it was great. He was wearing an LSU tiger shirt because the tigers too may have to be uh, protected with air quality. At night, little chair, um, people coming in. Okay. So things are kind of a mess. Well, I'll go back to the title. Um, I got to thinking much about Milton's Paradise Lost, right? So this is uh, a piece where uh, 
this is a drawing I did of concrete poetry. That was a, a genre at the time of Milton. And also thinking of putting Milton's Paradise Lost on falling columns. This was the photo I took after Katrina, falling columns. I'm sure that's where it all pulled together. So I first did this for um, a biennial open spaces in Kansas City and Swope Park. And uh, there I had about 50 columns. Uh, they're all covered. This is the area of the, the park. And they're all covered in Milton's poem, Paradise Lost. And they're in highway reflective vinyl, so you can see it at night. Why? Milton was blind, and one of his big uh, attempts with his poem was to make darkness visible, darkness being the hell. And also him being blind, I said, oh, how good of, of me to give it in reflective vinyl. So here's Milton. Um, you know, each column has a different uh, section of the poem. And then uh, the Superdome, where I won the Demolition Derby in 1975, they got in touch with me, this sculpture organization called the Hellas Sculpture uh, Garden or something. Anyway, they run the entire middle ground of Poydras Avenue right in front of the Superdome. And so they said, how about putting your columns in front of the Superdome? I said, Oh, I'd love to, you know, why secretly they had just changed the name from the Mercedes-Benz Superdome to Caesar's Palace Superdome. So it had such fun connotations to the fall of civilizations and whatnot. So I now have 70 columns of Milton's Paradise Loss in front of the Caesar's Superdome. So this is it in a downtown. I don't know that it works so well, but before I did that piece of Milton. This is from the re retrospective, but these blue columns and the wrecking ball, this was a uh, part of a piece I did for uh, at Mass Mocha for an exhibition that ran a couple of years where they paired me with Lonnie Holly, who always does thumbs up for the mothership and I'm always doing mothership one, two or three. So anyway, these, col these falling columns uh, and here I was overtly also wanting to deal with my bringing my Southern, what, what people expect of a Southern artist up to Mass Mocha and have these columns falling. Um, and um, this is um, a gate, Paradise Lost. I don't want to talk about that now. Trees, we're going to have to save. Um, you think I should get to the retrospective? Uh, before what time, how much time do we have in this section? You've got another 20 minutes. Okay, good. So I'll go through this quickly and we'll get to the retrospective for those watching who, who would like to know about that. And then with the students afterwards, I'm gonna break out into different portfolios. Uh, okay. This is, uh, I'm very interested in discarded tools um, agriculture is going bust and what happens to all of the tools and I mentioned in the beginning Donna Haraway and the sugar and the industrial exchange across the Atlantic so there's lots of pieces I've done with tools that are rusting and I call the whole body of work tools losing definition and uh, this is a mix of photographic pieces on front panels and real objects in the rear. Okay, mothership stuff. Let's see. Well, I guess we can speak of this. I mentioned the ring, right? Uh, and say by 2045, we're gonna have 9 billion people and what if we have to leave the earth and how are we going to fit everyone on the spaceships? Of course, it's not going to happen that well, right? It'll be um, survival of the fittest, survival of the rich, and it's not going to be pretty if that happens. So here's people in relation to the spaceships. 
Of course, my spaceships, people can be all in these things, right? All right. So I use the ring occasionally, kind of, what do they call them, pop-ups. Every now and then I'll bring my ring somewhere. This was in a show in Houston at Transart. This was out in an abandoned place where I did Mothership 3 called Mothership the Station, as though that's where people went to take off and they couldn't even bring their suitcases. So throughout the exhibition, there's discarded human uh, clothing, shoeing, souvenirs, uh, because it, there's only room for people and whatever you can take in your hand. Here's the uh, station spaceship depot. All right, this was uh, the entrance to the Mass Mocha show with Lonnie. This was Mothership One, Postulations of Myth and Math. And that's where I came up with the 2045. Stephen Hawking grabbed onto that year, the astrophysicist. Then you had the Rome Report, uh, people who gathered in Rome in uh, the mid 70s. They also identified that year. And it's also projected in some myth myths. Water, this is a piece about water. Souvenirs of Earth, forget it. Asteroid. We're going to get to that in the retrospective show. I've moved the asteroid now to my yard, which we can't talk about. This is going to be in the next presentation, but in the 92, AIDS had started before that, but this was a video piece. I think it's one of my best video pieces called Almost Touching You, where this couple dances to Chet Baker's song, Almost Blue. And you can hear the crinkling of the plastic as this male tries to dance with a nude female. It's projected life-size onto a dark wall sometime in corners. This is it in the retrospective. And it really felt like they were in the room. It was great. So space clowns, this is the end of the space clowns. This is a series, The Vanquished, where I did it also at a time when my mother was in a slow death, kind of, you know, losing so much weight, becoming skeletal. But it was... She lived a long life. It was beautiful. But this, I said, well, even the space clowns are going to die. We all die. Materiality doesn't hold out. So these are some of the space clowns starting to uh, lose their form and become stardust. And the irony is we are stardust, right? It's That's what we're made of. So my cat is coughing in the background. I'm sorry. All right. I'm going to show you the retrospective. This is so silly, but it was great to have these kind of banners with the landscapes on on the front. And uh, here here is the asteroid that I made. I call it Between Time. David, is this showing okay? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. So, again, I was thinking that just 65 million years ago, an asteroid hit, right? We talked about that, wiped out life. I said, what if another one were to come? And, you know, there's one in about 20 years, none projected to be as bad as the one that killed most life. But nonetheless, just to keep things in perspective, uh, I said, I'm going to build an asteroid. But I built it to fit into this nave at the top of the museum steps in their great hall. And it's mostly aluminum, some other metals that you would find in a real asteroid. There it is. Um, we already talked about the Vanquish series. They surrounded the asteroid. And I gave the asteroid, asteroid an amorphic type shape. So it was also a space clown. Now, within the exhibition, you know, a lot of my early work, it was who gets a seat on the bus? In the lace, in the latter work with these spaceships, who gets a seat on the bus? So that's a question. 
I always want to continuously ask myself. So this is a CB radio. And I did this project, same year I did the demolition derby, David. This is 75. And 12 outdoor stainless steel telephone housing units, AT&T, gave me loan for a year. I gutted them and turned them into CB radio booths. So here you see. And I put them all throughout a three parish area. I got a special license from the FCC so everyone could talk in the same channel. And it was about breaking down barriers, right? Enlarging the seating capacity on the bus. No one knows what color you are, how much money you have, what you're wearing. So I thought it was an, a democratic form of social media before we had the internet. But that's what the good things about the internet is something I was trying to create here. So this is these these units today. Nobody, we don't have pay phones. We don't have CBs. So I was uh, happy to put those in the museum show. I'm grateful to them. This was a piece kind of setting the alarm, drummer boy. How do we bring people uh, into war? There used to be the drummer boy, and you'd, you'd lure them in with the sound. you get everybody worked up. So this was a piece called Crossing the Line, the Drummer Boy in the show, and it's a video work. This was the lead drummer in the early 90s for the St. Og Marching Band, spectacular drummer, and you can see his face in the drumming, but it's ominous, um, of course. And this would lead you into the first the CB drummer boy. And then you can see the video almost touching you is uh, they're dancing there. There's a lot of sound bleed, but it worked. That was the drummer. That's not part of the piece, but that's who he was, spectacular. And this was an early study, the crossing the line. Oh, forget that. Okay. Super convergence. In 1991, we entered the Gulf War, and uh, we also uh, decided to maintain uh, our Super Bowl that was hosted in, I think, Tampa. And Whitney Houston sang the national anthem, and the television network was so indiscriminate that one of the supers this is a negative. This is not digital. This is a negative. It says the Gulf War Super Bowl. So I was, uh, I got, I had gotten my camera out uh, when I realized they were going to go ahead with the game. And I started photographing every frame uh, because for me, it was kind of the propaganda, you know, it was a simulacrum of sort. But anyway, the original piece that I showed right after the Super Bowl in 1991. It shows how they kept cutting back and forth, you know, with the oil, uh, oil profits scoring a record, De uh, birds covered in oil in the Gulf. You've got halftime news with, oh, they're gonna bomb the ziggurat. And we're of course at war with the oldest civilization and we're the youngest. So you'd have the ziggurat, then they'd cut to the halftime show with Disneyland and Mickey Mouse. So it was just nuts. And then uh, General, I'll show you some. So there you see on the upper upper uh, right, we've got the castle and the, these are all stills, the Gulf War still. Now, if you look at the lower images, left, far left and far right, they're using that squiggly mark, right, to show where, how the quarterback got blitz, like so-and-so went here, here, and there. And they're using the same squiggle lines to show where the troops are moving in Iraq. Okay, so these are some of the stills. And then they're showing explosions. It's the moment of the smart bomb. So they have pharmaceutical commercials with with painkillers exploding. And then they're showing the hatch over uh, targets. 
And uh, anyway, there's countdowns and guns and and this this is you know one of the early goddesses from uh, Mesopotamia with Mickey Mouse. So this was a piece I did in 89, 90, 91. It was. Soul Shadows, America House, and Urban Warrior Myths. It's a big project I did that toured uh, based on a lot of work I did in a prison for several years with violent juvenile offenders and some of adult populations. And that led me to working with a youth gang. And that youth gang ended up being involved with the corrupt faction of the New Orleans Police Department. So that is a whole nother talk. It would take me a week to tell you that. But let's just stick with the facade of that project, which are these doors. Uh, there's no videos now that traveled, uh, th that were part of that piece. There were 10 hours of videos and lots of other things. But in the retrospective, just the doors were shown. And of course, behind the doors is empty. And that's something I'll talk with the curatorial group about. But these were doors shot 8990. I think this is the last door on the far uh, right with an American flag. So that was during the Gulf War. I added that one. But these were security, decorative security doors in the city of New Orleans. And so I asked the question, who's in jail? You know, behind these doors, I was showing the kids who are in jail, but we're all in it together. So it's got to be a unified solution. You can't just tuck the problem away. So anyway, these are um, different decorative doors in New Orleans. All right. They're the doors in relationship to almost touching you. And you see all the way in the back, a little statue. That's a big 70 foot video work with a sculpture called Where's Mary? We're getting to her. Um, this is a piece I did called Fence Night. We're not gonna talk about that now, okay. This was the original piece from 1990. You see the doors and there were all these rooms and videos and sound. All right, we already talked about face of God. This is the turtle eggs being laid in the sand, though, which starts the piece off. This is in the hospital suite, the last suite. The book. There's the cello again. All right. We talked about water markers. And... This is another view of the glass floor and the water markers heading back to one of my rings. This was a variation. I'm not going to talk about it now. This was in Beacon, wasn't it? This show was in Beacon, David. Yes, it was. Okay. Um, we talked about the burnt chimes. Now, when you're standing in this corridor, you can look back, you see the doors at the distance. Then you go into the ring area and you look this way. That's another piece. We talked about this, talked about the landscapes. And, you know, the chain holding the wrecking ball, it was, hey, the wrecking ball was way before Miley Cyrus's video, okay? Way before. But I've used change, chains for a long time. This was again in the, late 80s, early 90s, the, the, the weight of slavery, right? I was weighing chains. Um, and this is broken links, okay. Parlor games, we talked about this, this first at Mass Mocha. But even though I said, David, I was bringing these Southern columns kind of in a cliche way up to Mass Mocha in the heart of New England. The truth is these columns have been replicated and replicated. Here is a fresco. You see the two, the white columns with the blue capitals, dead ringers for the ones I have. This is from the 15th century of a courtyard in Siena. So, so anyway, it all repeats itself. What's the story's all the same? Isn't that 
um, the song? Okay. So the big ring had to make it into the retrospective, and here it is intersecting a wall, and it's in front of a 30, 38 foot, let's see, this is 24, 16, but yeah, 38 foot landscape, but it goes into a corner and wraps around, and this landscape features the big ring falling into this fiery landscape. Let's see if I have a close up. Oh, okay, maybe later. I showed you the boat, Dirge for Journey, that I collaborated with Terence Blanchard uh, on. And this is the small remnant. We couldn't put the whole boat in the show, but from these little mics, speakers inside all of these horns made the most beautiful sound. And um, there we go. So they have, and this is looking at these small circles going to the big ring. This was one of the original dirges. You see all the instruments in it. This was at a show at the museum in Dallas. This was somewhere else. And this again was um, in the Swan Song House. Now the mantle, I ended up bringing up to Mass Mocha, but I first showed it in New Orleans, working out souvenirs of Earth, like why in metals well if we're taking things through the atmosphere and we're going to a new place we need materials so of course aluminum would melt but put that aside the overture is i wanted to make a more solid material so um and so this is the mantle as it was in the retrospective where it's more solidified the objects are really conjoined now with the mantle and I turned to, you know, a Warhol moment or replication. In the end, if we can't bring up the originals, right? There's no room. You saw how many people we have to get on the bus. We can't bring the originals. Wouldn't it be ironic that a little souvenir of the David or the Michelangelo's, you know, what if these things became the real <laughs> value? There you go. Anyway, that was my thinking. I, I'm not having time now to touch on Warhol and and all of that time period, but it, you know, we, we it, probably better we probably better wrap up the wrap all right. up. All right, here's we're gonna get out of this. There's a lot with ladders. My last thing, ladders. Why ladders? You escape, but you also climb up to the highest building to see into the future, to see lotus coming, to see the dust storm to see invading troops. So ladders became in the medieval ages and now for me, a symbol of the fu of future, seeing into the future. All right, so that's one of uh, Cathedral in Bath, England, and they're all climbing up. So we're gonna close her out. Oh, you're not seeing Where's Mary. I did a dirt, but I have dirt from all over the world collected as an altar. Where Mary? So in that room, I did this piece uh, with this old marble sculpture, a very old sculpture I found in a junk shop. And I turned that sculpture into the last surviving thing from earth. And she's catapulted by way of explosion into deep space through fires. And so this piece, I think John Fishback may be here. He did wonderful sound work on this piece. Thank you, John. Um, so I'll just show you. And we're going to close it out with the last thing to survive. We're Mary. She lost her child, of course. Okay. That's extraordinary. All right. Sorry about that. Um, no, no, no apologies necessary. That what a, what a perfect way to end that show. I so wish I'd seen that installation. Well, uh, th thank you, Don, for sharing some. You know, you know the, your the journey of your uh, of your practice from from the mid seventies to today is really quite remarkable. You know, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I, there's a lot to talk about and a lot to think about. So, uh, 
we'll end this now and we will meet up again in a few minutes uh, on the private Zoom with the graduate students. So again, thank you. Thank you for doing this with us, Don. It was, you know, it's just, you know, you, you, you think you know somebody <laughs> and, and, and yet, you know, here's work that's just blowing my mind. So it's, thank you so much for sharing this with us. And we'll, we'll see you all next week. Those of you who are following this webinar series where we'll be uh, uh, at, a, at an early, at, at, at an earlier time uh, uh, to see the, uh, the Turkish artist Ahmet Oget working, uh, talking to us out of Istanbul. So uh, uh, and you'll get an email about the time if you just follow the uh, the SPA uh, um, uh, 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 website for the art practice for the uh, curatorial practice program. Okay, thank you all very much. See you in a couple of seconds on on the other on the other okay. website. Okay, bye.